We're very excited to be moving on to our next session, a discussion on the interconnected challenges of recovery, climate change, and inequality with the managing director of the IMF, Dr. Kristalina Georgieva. Um, just before we start that, we have a wonderful uh, video from our partners on this event. This event is organized in partnership with the Kapuscinski Development Lectures, the European Commission, and UNDP. And we have a video from Juta Erplanayan, the European Commissioner for International Partnerships. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Columbia University and the United Nations Development Programme for hosting our Kapuczynski Development Lecture Series. I am especially pleased that today's event is part of the ninth Annual International Conference on Sustainable Development. The theme, Research for Impact, an inclusive and sustainable planet, is near to my heart. A year and a half ago, skeptics doubted that we could develop a vaccine against COVID-19 within less than 10 years. It took less than one year. The pandemic has reminded humankind of our fragility, but also of the power of human to adapt, to invent. Our speaker today, my dear Kristalina Girgieva, is no stranger to visionary responses. Whether at the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank or the European Commission, she has tackled the challenges of sustainable development with fresh ideas. She continues to press for equity today from the IMF and is a strong ally of the EU. Dear friends, the European Union works for a sustainable and inclusive future for all. This is at the heart of our partnerships, also with the IMF. In response to the pandemic, Team Europe mobilized 46 billion euros to support partner countries. We continue to work with our partners in advancing vaccine and medicine manufacturing. We have also launched global initiatives and partnerships to address climate change tackle the digital divide and reinvigorate multilateralism. And together we will scale up the sustainable finance. Mrs. Giergeva will be accompanied by Jeffrey Sachs, whom I thank for his availability today and good past cooperation. Colleagues, together we can build a brighter future. I hope the following conversation inspires you. And over to you again, Jeff, to begin our wonderful session with Dr. Georgieva. Thank you very much. I know everyone's going to be inspired. Uh, Kristalina, we're thrilled uh, that you're with us uh, and uh, absolutely thrilled that you're giving the Kapuczynski lectures, which uh, as you know, is a partnership with the European Union and the European Commission, uh, which uh, you have also helped to lead uh, in your absolutely illustrious uh, and, and pathbreaking uh, career. Uh, Kristalina Georgieva is the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, and she has been in that position since uh, October 1, 2019. In other words, arriving just in time for a pandemic. Uh, which was uh, not exactly what was uh, anticipated on October 1, 2019. Before that, uh, Kristalina was uh, uh, leader of the World Bank, uh, and uh, before that uh, was uh, vice president of the European Commission, uh, and before that was uh, in uh, countless senior responsibilities in international finance and at the World Bank as vice president for many important matters. And I can say there's uh, no one in the world that is doing more uh, than Kristalina uh, in solving the problems of finance that we have been discussing with Laura Cozy uh, just uh, in the first uh, half hour. Uh, the, the incredible uh, gap uh, 
really hard to understand economically uh, between the uh, overflowing credit uh, and capital at almost no cost or negative interest rates available to the rich countries and the often uh, punishing or closed windows for the poorest countries that are most desperately in need of capital. And it's not simply that they're riskier. Uh, it's uh, that the countries that print the international currencies uh, have, have a special uh, advantage. Uh, and uh, how to overcome this uh, is, has been part of Kristalina's uh, uh, urgent uh, role since uh, October 2019. Uh, we're to talk about three issues, recovery, climate change, and inequality, but we're not quite at the recovery phase yet. We're still in the COVID pandemic phase. And I wonder if you could, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to uh, help people to understand what has been the financial emergency during the COVID period and still without the vaccine coverage, what, what is the urgent financing right now then I, I hope we'll turn to recovery because we hope we'll get there and talk about climate change and, and, uh, and, and global inequality. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Great to be uh, speaking with you today. And I want to thank uh, the uh, commissioner for the introduction she uh, gave me. It is very important to recognize that what she said about the contribution of science, not only for the health of people, but for the economy has to be uh, recognized. So where are we today? Because of two things, because of the arrival of vaccines with uh, such an incredible speed and because of the massive support provided by central banks, by finance authorities, we are in recovery from the depth of the crisis we experienced last year. But this recovery is uneven and it remains somewhat uncertain. It looks a little bit like yo-yo. Uh, we open, the, the economy moves, and then we have to restrict activities and the economy slows down. What is important to recognize is that in this recovery, there is a very dangerous divergence between countries that have access to vaccines, unlimited, and have capacity to support their economies and countries that do not. On the vaccine front, uh, as of mid-September, we have uh, about 65% of the population in uh, high-income countries vaccinated at least with one dose, whereas in the uh, uh, low-income countries, it is around 2%. It's a dramatic difference. In terms of economic support, uh, advanced economies from January 21, since the beginning of this year, have provided $2.6 trillion of extra pandemic-related uh, 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 measures. Whereas in the uh, low-income countries, in the emerging markets, minus the, the you know, better performing emerging markets, uh, the amount is 200 billion. 2.6 trillion, 200 billion. And of course, that translates into the uh, growth prospects of these groups of countries. We are expecting to see advanced economies and some well-performing emerging markets doing well this year. The, we, are, we are projecting 6%, around plus minus 6% growth this year. But the composition of this 6% continues to change and it is not in favor of developing countries. In other words, the prospects for recovery for developing countries have more shadows than the uh, prospects of advanced economies. Now, if on top of it, we experience a asymmetric inflation, and we are already seeing it in some emerging market uh, e uh, economies, inflation is pressing central banks to raise interest rates. 
then it can become a double blow on their prospects to grow. Uh, and if in some advanced economies, especially in the United States, the recovery, which is a, which is a good thing because it, it, has, it has positive spillover, but if the recovery leads to faster tightening of financial conditions, there could be an additional blow to countries with high level, especially of dollar denominated debt. And this is, so my, my, my main message here is that this is where we are. We need not be there. Vaccinating the world is a solvable problem. We are actually producing enough vaccines for everybody, but we are not yet distributing vaccines in a way that would provide the ground for accelerating the recovery. And I'm uh, very uh, 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 pleased to see that more attention is being paid to that. More attention is being paid to increase vaccine production. More attention is being paid to where these vaccines go and how the countries are able to use them once they arrive effectively. I think it's uh, really notable and important to emphasize tomorrow, President Biden is hosting a vaccine summit. Uh, and this could be a breakthrough if the US and the other vaccine producing countries, China, Russia, uh, UK, European Union, India, all participate. And I hope I'll give the responsibility, if I may put it on you and, uh, and the UN system, to say, look, you provide the doses, we'll make sure that these get into the arms, even in the poorest countries, because that's what the yep. UN can do together with the IMF, because the IMF can ensure there's a financing flow. Uh, I'll ask you to say something about the new yep. SDR allocation and how it could play a role in that, in, in this emergency moment. But we need the global cooperation because you know, even if the vaccines are there, they're not going to get to the poor people unless there's a system. And the only place that there's a system is the UN system. Uh, mm -hmm. and, but the UN hasn't been able to get the vaccines because it's been uh, basically mm -hmm. taken by, by the rich countries uh, up until now. But I, I wanted to highlight uh, a, a point you mentioned uh, that I think is interesting. I, I would have expected a much worse crash up financially. Mm -hmm than yep. occurred. In fact, not only was there not a crash up, stock market soared in the last two yep. years. And the, the reason was that there, like the uh, vaccine uh, development that came very fast, the other piece of good news is that there was global cooperation on financing, mm -hmm. notably starting around March mm -hmm. 2020, uh, a few weeks into the pandemic, the central banks and the IMF got together and said, we will not have a financial crisis come out of this. Maybe you could describe a little bit more because I think people should understand that wasn't an automatic uh, at the moment. I thought there would be a, a, a worse financial crisis than occurred, but there was yeah. this response and it's a successful policy response. I, I could not agree with you more. I, I don't think we have given enough credit to central bankers and also to finance ministries. What we did was we ripped off the benefits of many years of creating cooperation at the level of finance ministers and central bankers. The IMF is the natural place for it. We had multiple emergency meetings of the uh, IMFC, the International Monetary and Finance Committee with the objective to consolidate first our analysis of the nature of this crisis. We did this really fast, uh, Jeff, and uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the contribution the staff of the IMF made. It is a crisis like no other in which we tell producers to not produce, don't go to work, and we tell consumers to not go to markets. And therefore the response had to be exactly what it was, massive monetary policy and financial support and done in a coordinated manner. I say bravo 
to all those who have tirelessly communicated to make sure that not only they are out for the rescue of their businesses and households, but they do it in coordinated fashion. So the impact for the global economy is as it was. We uh, projected a much more severe recession. It was still the worst recession in peacetime since the Great Depression, but it was much less severe because of these measures. And uh, especially with the arrival of vaccines and the fact we learned how to function with the pandemic still around us, uh, we, we are now seeing a, a, a recovery. But let's not fool ourselves. It is not yet where it should be. We risk to lose $9 trillion in output between now and 2025 if we don't accelerate vaccinating the world. And this is why I am so, so uh, 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 thrilled to, to see that tomorrow President Biden is bringing everybody on a COVID summit. Uh, and it is actually reinforcing something that uh, the IMF together with the uh, WHO, the World Bank and WTO has been advocating for, which is vaccinate up to, we were saying 60% by mid next year, I understand the summit would go for, for 70% by end of 2022 and do so in a way that is as impactful across the world as possible. Let's not forget, we don't uh, stop the pandemic. We leave fertile ground for more mutations and more risks, even for the advanced economies where vaccinations have advanced. I think it, by the way, it's, uh, I want to underscore something you said uh, also for uh, everybody and, and really important. Uh, you said that one of the things that happened was uh, analysis of, mm -hmm. of, of the crisis. And I think uh, it, it's not easy for a lot of people to recognize how important the international institutions are for analytics because mm -hmm. politicians within a country are arguing about power and politics. They're not doing the analysis. It's regrettable. But so much of what we know and what we know we need to do, say the IPCC report, which tells us why we need to get to net zero, or the International Energy Agency report, which tells us how to get to net zero, or the IMF staff work that you talked about, which said we must respond to this crisis in the following way, could not have been done at the national level mm -hmm. and would not have been done, and certainly not in 193 countries. And so yes. I'd like people to appreciate we cannot put a step in front of the other without the multilateral system. Yeah. Uh, and that is not, you know since the politicians uh, grab the screen nationally or the social media, the real work that's getting done is not understood properly and, and yeah. therefore undervalued, uh, even denigrated when it's politically convenient for one politician or another to blame the international system. But I'd like to underscore that point of the analysis that was done because where else is this gonna be done after all? Yes. I, I could not agree more with that. And that has to continue. Uh, and I want to, uh, you asked about the uh, special drawing rights. I want to say a word about that. Yeah. But then also on how we need to deploy understanding the interconnectivity in the economy to win the fight against climate change, to win the fight against inequality. Uh, on the special drawing rights, they're really a demonstration of international action at the time of crisis. What they are is using the strength of the collective of 190 members of the IMF to create reserves that are uh, distributed to everybody, but they're most useful for the countries that are in weak position in this crisis. $650 billion is a shot in the arm that helps countries have the fiscal space for vaccines, 
have the fiscal space to inject more uh, into the recovery. They are above all a proof that we are in this together, we can only get out of it together. And now we are working on ways in which we can amplify the impact of the 650 billion by getting countries in strong positions to own land some of their SDRs so they can be deployed where they need it the most. But let me say, looking into the future, what we prioritize from an analytic standpoint at the IMF. First, we prioritize economic policy that can help countries take advantage of this structural transformation that is already underway towards the uh, new digital economy and towards the new climate economy. What we want is to use the unique strength of the IMF that is an institution engaging regularly with its members on a country by country basis and also on a global uh, level to identify policy priorities and then support the right policy actions. It is the technical term is for those who know is article four consultations. What it is is a, a space to make sure that everybody can benefit from learning from other places. And when we do that, what we see so clearly is that uh, we cannot afford to miss any country taking this turn. Cannot be that we have developing countries falling behind on digitalization and on low carbon uh, climate resilient uh, future. Uh, I want to make one, one pitch here, and it is that when we think about climate and when we think about inequality, these two things have to be put together because climate action can create a fertile ground to also unaddress inequality within countries and across countries. I'm mindful of time and I want to be sure that, that uh, uh, we have the time for me to answer your questions. No, thank, thank you and uh, very, very uh, clear. And I think the overarching question and the puzzle for me uh, also as a, as a practicing economist of uh, international finance is, uh, this divide of access to capital is probably the, the most uh, uh, important structural divide actually between the rich and the poor countries right now. The poor countries need capital, mm -hmm. but they pay, they pay a huge premium to get it. The rich countries, which also need capital, but the, not the way the poor countries need it, uh, are paying historically low rates. To some extent, yes, it may be poor countries uh, are riskier in some sense, but it does seem that it's uh, deeper than that. Uh, risky countries uh, within uh, a, a currency union uh, of the uh, you know, Eurozone or others borrow more easily. Uh, it, it seems that there is a privilege of being the dollar printer uh, in the world. There is a, a privilege of having the European Central Bank so what structurally can we do at scale mm -hmm. to uh, really <laughs> enable the capital for this bold digital and green recovery to be financed? The same question that uh, Laura Cozy was posing uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the first part of this hour. Yep. How shall we proceed on that? Well, uh, I have uh, uh, three parts of my answer. The first part is that uh, there has been a lot done to create vehicles for financing in developing countries through multilateral development banks, through national development banks, and also through the IMF. It is paramount that we work together and we look at ways in which we can massively increase the power the impact of this financing by securing a coordinated 
approach to deploying this money. Uh, just uh, look at the IMF, we have a, about $1 trillion lending capacity of which 280 billion is being used. In other words, we have a lot of spare capacity. We have the $650 billion SDRs that has been just deployed. We are working on creating more on lending capacity on concessional terms, on more concessional terms. Uh, through this on lending of SDRs, I spoke about if all of us look at deploying existing financial resources on scale, in coordinated manner, we would make a big uh, difference. Uh, and I want to praise uh, uh, the uh, um, Agence France de Développement, uh, Rémi Rieu, who has created a coalition of national development banks that is linked to development finance. And I believe we would see very positive outcome of the work uh, he has uh, steered and is now uh, really taking, uh, taking on. Secondly, we have to recognize that to have capital flow into a country, it is important for the country to have rule of law, transparency in governance, good investment conditions. And that continues to be at the heart of the work of the IMF. We want to make countries more trustworthy for investment by working with, with them on their own uh, desires to have good policies in place and to have strong institutions, vi vibrant institutions in place. Uh, look at this crisis, uh, Jeff. Countries that were in with strong fundamentals hit by the pandemic, which stood that hit much better than countries with weak fundamentals. So this is not new, but it remains very, very important. And number three, make sure that there are the right policy priorities for investment, that we are not creating the economy of yesterday, but we are creating the economy of tomorrow. This is where the work Laura is doing is so important. We need to have that vision, foresight for the future. And then, as you said, we need the uh, uh, multilateral institutions, United Nations to be there for countries to help them make every penny count for their future. What well, one one thing I, I agree with all of that uh, wholeheartedly. I, I would add one uh, component that has always been tricky, but probably is uh, more urgent than ever, and with some progress, uh, and that is uh, global tax reform and administration yeah. so that developing yeah. countries can actually collect money from multinational companies and not have it all be transferred into tax havens. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I'm could sure that, that the international institutions could, could really help on that uh, as and well. And there is, there is a bright uh, sign now because we are moving towards uh, international tax reform. I saw in the chat, that somebody asked about natural capital, what role this would play. So I want to say that we at the IMF are now integrating natural capital in the review of the assets that countries have, their people, their physical assets, financial uh, resources, and, and the uh, incredibly highly valuable nature. And that uh, thinking of this, comprehensive holistic approach to how countries can grow, how they can benefit of that natural capital uh, is incredibly important. Uh, uh, one of our economists uh, specializes in looking into how whales contribute to uh, sinking carbon in the oceans, <clears throat> how elephants contribute uh, to nature. And we have lots of people looking into ecosystem services as generator of wealth. Let me thank you for your uh, really uh, unique and powerful leadership uh, and also for all the innovations that are coming out of the IMF. I, the takeaway I think for all of us is how much fantastic thinking uh, we depend on and that you're providing and the IMF is providing the International Energy Agency, the international system uh, we have, uh, I, I think, a clear 
uh, direction and mandate. We have to uh, immunize the world and uh, go green and digital and finance that uh, in a satisfactory way. So uh, the uh, uh, I think the roadmap is uh, becoming clearer thanks to your work and, and leadership. We have a very uh, intensive and urgent uh, schedule ahead, uh, but uh, I, I know you're going to be uh, leading that. Let me thank you on behalf of everybody uh, listening uh, and uh, all that uh, will hear this uh, in the days and weeks ahead as uh, many, many people uh, tune into uh, the conference proceedings. Thank you again, uh, Crystalina, for, for being with us. Uh, it's uh, been a, a wonderful discussion. And I will uh, turn it back over to Lauren Barreto to uh, give us our directions for the next hour. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you again to Dr. Kotsi and Dr. Georgieva. It was wonderful to have you. We have parallel sessions right now. So I hope everybody will migrate over there to uh, view some of our great research and academic work. And we hope to see everybody back on again later today. We have the CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation, Raj Shah, and the Prime Minister of Barbados later in our program today. Thank you for being with us and see you online later. Bye.